There we go. Okay. Um, so I would like to start off with a territorial acknowledgement. And as in previous years, we wanted to make this a collective land acknowledgement, seeing as we're gathered today from the ancestral, asserted, and in many cases, unceded territories of so many First Nations peoples across this incredible bioregion and beyond. So I'd like to invite you to join in by posting in the chat your name and the territories from which you are calling in from today. Hi, everyone. Hello. And um, so as we share where we're connecting from, I'd like to specifically honor in relation to the work of Immerse, the deep longstanding place-based knowledge and stewardship of indigenous peoples across the Salish Sea bioregion. We recognize too that a land acknowledgement is only a first step and must be part of a broader active and ongoing process of decolonizing institutions and practices and ensuring more respectful relationships moving forward. We endeavor to continue engaging in this work in a spirit of both learning and unlearning what is needed to act in solidarity and bring about the changes needed. Um, so thank you all. And um, the timeline today, so our first 45 minutes or so will be our speaker series, and then we'll be shifting into our AGM. And just a note that if you didn't receive the notice of this event via our e-newsletter and would like to be part of that list, then you can uh, send an email to info at immerse.org. And so um, I'd like to introduce our, our third mini speaker series, Perspectives on the Salish Sea, where we'll be hearing from three presenters on their unique approaches to better understanding the biodi biodiversity and change in the incredible Salish Sea bioregion. Um, so after each speaker, speaker has presented, we'll have time for a brief Q&A. And so at that point, I'd invite you to put any questions into the chat. And so we'll be a little limited in what we'll be able to address during that time. It'll be about five minutes each. Um, but I'd encourage you to connect, continue connecting in the chat. And um, speakers, if you'd like, um, you can include your contact info there as well. Um, so our first speaker is David Denning, who will be presenting on Sea Stars Don't Suck. I'm sorry, I was on mute. And a few things happened all of a sudden. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, uh, it's in a group of, of people and an organization that I've been very, very excited about hearing about. And now I get to join it. So thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'd like to talk today uh, about sea stars. I fell in love with sea stars when I was a young person. And uh, I'm hoping that this will work because it just didn't that time around. Uh, I did test it, but okay. Um, and I spent a lot of time uh, visiting an aunt of mine, great aunt of mine in Sausalito, California, looking out at San Francisco Bay and uh, right in front of her house were rocks uh, and a, um, rocks. And I, I, I first saw sea stars there and she, I think she either had had a, a lot of love for me or she uh, wanted to uh, make my life more interesting and, and difficult because she gave me this book when I was in high school, Between Pacific Tides, and it certainly changed my whole life. And uh, so uh, at, at the time, I had found myself quite enamored with sea stars, but of course, nudibranchs and all kinds of things showed up. And I had a really interesting high school career including in that high school career, a bunch of time with Harvey Jensen, who is dear to all of you here, I know, um, and especially Pam, of course. Um, 
And uh, during that time, I, I got to know a lot of marine life as a youth, a young person, and eventually ended up working with my high school biology teacher, Bruce Russell, for 40 years, making films about biology and teaching biology. So I was very fortunate to have done that. And I certainly believe that all of us who are involved with the sciences, uh, biological sciences, can, should try to be mem uh, mentors of young people because it certainly seems to have a tremendous effect on people. So I spent my life looking in tide pools, inventing weird contraptions to go underwater when I was a, an, a walking uh, marine biologist. Uh, and of course, there are always questions and that's the whole whole wonder of the shore, among other things that, uh, how do these animals live in that shore, a seashore? And uh, well, at, I was pretty convinced and I'd been taught that sea stars actually hold on to the rocks using suction, and there, there's a little disc. It was, I always used to teach that uh, your your those little fridge um, suction cups that hold things on your fridge were uh, a good model for what would happen. And there's a little muscle right in the base, in the center of that disc on the bottom, and it pulls up and creates suction. And about seven years ago, that was totally turned upside down. But I I have to admit, I didn't think about it. Uh, it was it was a given to my mind. And of course, someone with some good scanning uh, electron microscopy technique, uh, Elaine will be, of course, knowing all about this kind of stuff. Um, they they uh, looked into really what was happening through cross sections and TEMs, and they, and they discovered that, in fact, uh, these wonderful organs, of which there are many thousands on some of our larger sea stars, uh, have some very intricate uh, structure. And uh, they published a paper. This was a group, Hennebert, Santos, and Flamang. And uh, they told me and the world that sea stars don't suck. And that was very exciting to me to uh, figure out all about this. And the, the gist of it was there, they found three different types of, of uh, tube feet in sea stars. The, the blunt ones on the left uh, are more pushers and they did not have, it structurally did not have the, the, the essential uh, uh, organs, small microscopic organs for actually holding on to the rocks. And those are the types that are found in mud substrates. Uh, Luidia and, and others like that. Uh, but the other two, especially the ones on the far right, which were um, which were really elaborate in their internal structure, had a variety of different organs. In fact, there were three different actual cellular factories within within each of the tube feet. Two of the factories are actually gluing factories. The third factory would be, you guessed it, an unglue factory. And so they are actually emitting uh, chemicals into the surface, under the under the surface of the tube foot, and and uh, first of all, attaching to, to the rock and then unattaching by dissolving away that glue. And they, they discovered that when they really looked carefully at this issue using microscopy of, of a variety of kinds, uh, they found that uh, you can see footprints across the rock. So now when I go to the shore, I imagine the whole rocks, especially where there are a lot of sea stars, being covered with the footprints of uh, sea stars. And it's a really, really interesting thing to observe uh, and, and talk about this because I'm more of a naturalist than I am a marine scientist. And I spend a lot of time talking with groups and over the years, I had really had a lot of encounters with people on the shore who were ripping sea stars off of the rock. And so I spent a lot of my time over the years trying to convince people that that was damaging. And now I even have more fodder in that particular argument that uh, we literally are ripping the, the legs off. And it's because they're glued securely on there. Uh, and of course, 
sea stars now have changed. The world of sea stars has changed immensely. As you know, in 2013, 14, the sea star wasting disease uh, epidemic that took place for about a year and a half there uh, absolutely decimated the sea stars all along our coast. And of course, you'd first see these lesions. Occasionally, you know, arms would be falling off. The animal would be reduced to a pile of tissue and then ultimately to a pile of ossicles. And this is a terrible thing. And it's really affected I, I, a lot of people in our community. I'm sure communities all along the coast, up and down the Pacific coast, where this was recorded. It became an opportunity for citizen science. Uh, because people could go out and monitor this. And so this is one of the connections that I I see with what you're doing, which is such a wonderful example of citizen science. But of the total array of sea stars on our island, we are the sea star capital of the world in many ways with 85 different species, mostly subtitled, but, but about seven or eight often in the intertidal. And this this affected about 19 different species. And uh, you see the, the 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 different degrees of affection, and it, it was first thought with some studies that were done originally. What caused this was the question, and some early studies showed that uh, there was a, a virus involved. It was called a denzovirus, and really, some of the early conclusions were that this virus was cross species and and uh, actually. Um, affected all of these other, all the 19 species. But in fact, it, the later work has shown that, it, that in fact, um, it's a very, very complex situation. And we just don't know at this point what has caused this wasting disease. It does appear that some species, we can identify the causative agents, uh, but for, cer for certain, um, this virus is involved with a lot of those uh, wasting disease issues. So on Salt Spring, we decided, and we have a group called, at that time it's called Salt Spring Ocean Stewards, and we decided to investigate this, are they recovering? And I am constantly asked, are the sea stars recovering? Uh, or I, uh, I'd i be walking down the street and people would run up to me and say, oh, I saw seven sea stars just the other day. And of course they want to know, are they recovering? And this is a scene, typical scene in Banfield, where I worked for five years teaching uh, the marine uh, education courses at the marine station. And uh, so we, we needed to know, and what I had to do was, was train a group, a group of citizens to do this. And uh, we needed to know a few things, but I put out the word and I thought, well, maybe we'd get 20 people. We got 107 people to participate in this study. So it was very interesting and exciting. We needed to know about their life cycles, uh, we needed to be able to distinguish a plague survivor because we were doing this three years after the major event from a new recruit. We needed to know how they be recruit uh, and uh, we needed to look in the right places. And so we, uh, you know, we, we had sessions where we learned how they reproduce and I won't go through that in detail. You all know that we learned how to measure uh, and we set up some protocols. Uh, and we had you just it was just so neat to have citizen involvement with a hundred people, including kids. Uh, so we had families that that were out and looking. And we looked at both adults and we looked for juveniles. And juveniles are hard to find. So we looked under rocks to do that. We had to do this uh, this survey in August because uh, those same rocks in July and June, uh, actually harbor plain fin midshipman nests. So we had to wait for them to, uh, we did find uh, juveniles and people learned how to identify how old they were. We, we were able to survey all those sites because we had a hundred people. Uh, and um, essentially uh, we found that there were juveniles, but they were uh, not really, they were sporadic and not in high concentrations. And then one day I was out looking for the few remaining individuals 
poker stars that were around. And I noticed that predation hadn't stopped. And, you know, I saw five sea stars this this uh, particular day. Only uh, only one of them, well, only four survived that particular day. So we're, we're, we continue to look. We're planning for another survey this year. And we continue to look for the juveniles. And I do that every time I'm on the beach. And they are recovering. There are juveniles, but it's very sure. The one, that, the species that was most heavily hit was Pisaster, uh, sorry, uh, Pi, whoo, e anyway, <laughs> uh, everybody knows the, the giant. Yeah, Pycnopodia helianthoides, thank you. Uh, the, the giant sunflower star. And uh, they have been hit incredibly hard. And there's there's been a lot of talk that they won't, that, that this is a, a on its way to extinction. Uh, but nature is resilient. And uh, I was kayaking up coast this year, and I saw zero of these Pycnopodia, except we happened to go through a paddle along shore uh, of the Helmkin Inlet, and we saw 30 just in a very small place. So it's possible that they will recover. The outlook was bad, but we're, you know, well, what's causing all this? Well, of course, uh, this is my house in 2018. Uh, and we know that storms are increasing. We know that this is climate, the climate crisis. And uh, this has flavored all of the work that I've done for about 40 years. But I think we need, need to continue to be vigilant about this. And the problem is that m most scientists, a lot of scientists, uh, just weren't acknowledging how how much problems they have until more recently. And this is a term that I have used for, for scientists, not in my lifetime. And I've heard that over and over again. And we can't be, uh, we can't be accepting that. It's really that simple. We're at, um, at record CO2 levels uh, and 350 is uh, parts per million uh, is the, is the level of which uh, the the Earth will re be stable, and we're at four hundred and twenty now. So um, it's um, it's really time time to uh, pay attention to that. Un unfortunately, so much of that has gone into the heat, extra heat that has gone into the sea, and so the result of that is that people don't realize what's happening because it's lost in the sea. And so, um, and there's so many things that, that are alarming about this heating of the sea, including the uh, uh, the bleaching of all of our coral reefs. At this point, we are on the, the edge of a uh, of a disaster, and I think people need to recognize that and act accordingly. And uh, this has been probably the most influential paper in my view for quite a while, the trajectories of the Earth ecosystem in the Anthropocene. And we are right on the edge of, of disaster, as we all probably here know, especially. Uh, and the, one of the biggest points is the tipping points, which in this case, uh, at least six of them are rapidly being approached. And that's a recent paper coming out. So. We have to move beyond the, the Nimlet stage. And I believe that Thomas Homer Dixon has really pointed out that we we don't have a choice. We have to command hope and, and act accordingly. And so like our group here on Salt Spring Island, um, recognizing the these loss of biodiversity has uh, started Nature Salt Spring, a new organization. We're two years into this. And we, our focus is really a largely on what we can do to educate people about the climate crisis and the context in bi of biodiversity. And so we have a vision, and that's to, that's for uh, much more opportunities for people to learn citizen science projects, more involvement. Of, of I can't read what my own writing there because of the. Uh, uh, I should put that over there, shouldn't I? Uh, let's see over here. Uh, yeah, citizen science research projects. And that's really why I'm really excited about uh, finding out more about your group. 
And ultimately, we'd like to see a nature house here on South Spring. Um, thank you very much for that. I'll just stop here. Thank you so much, David. Um, does anyone have any questions? We probably have just have time for maybe one quick question at this point. Um, Emily? <laughs> oh, yes. I was just applauding. But oh, thank you oh, for <laughs> the informative talk, David. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and if I can jump in, I'm just curious about how large the sunflower stars were that you had seen in that one small space. They they weren't mature, you know, the the three quarter meter <laughs> mature ones. They were they were immatures, I would say, or they were beyond juvenile stage. Uh, the, I think the largest one we saw was maybe uh, uh, fifty centimeters, forty centimeters across. Uh, oh. And but there were quite a few, and they they were all all beyond that early juvenile stage where you see they grow so quick quickly. Uh, that uh, I would say that they were in the two or three year sort of age bracket. Great, thank you. Sheila Byers here from Vancouver. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so our next speaker will be Andrea Jackman with a talk titled Exploring the Associations Between Diatoms and Eelgrass in the Salish Sea. Hi everyone, uh, let me just share my screen. All right, so my name's Andrea Jackman. I'm in the fourth year of my undergrad at the University of British Columbia. I'm working in Dr. Laura Parfrey's lab and I'll be talking about our collaboration with Immerse today. So this is eelgrass. It's a type of marine plant and it can be found growing in uh, meadows off of the coastline. So it can be found all across Canada and across the world. It's in lots of places around Vancouver and Vancouver Island. It's really locally, nationally and globally relevant. So why do we care about eelgrass? We care about it because it's a foundational species. This means that the ecosystem really depends on it. It acts as the base of the ecosystem and allows other species to be able to live there. Eelgrass meadows are incredibly valuable for both other organisms and for us because their inhabitants help take carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in biomass. They trap sediment and dirt, which help prevent uh, coastal erosion. They support a variety of organisms which promotes biodiversity and facilitates things like fishing. On this graph, you can see that they are the third most type of valuable uh, ecosystem right after open ocean and wetlands. But eelgrass ecosystems are being lost at a very rapid rate. You can see on this graph that most sites were decreasing in the 1990s and today this is even worse. Currently, every year, more than 100 kilometers of seagrass meadows are being lost. And this is really a big problem because they're such an important ecosystem. But we need to be able to understand this community and its interactions in order to help conserve it. So diatoms are one of the many organisms that can be found in seagrass meadows. Diatoms are photosynthetic single-celled algae, and they can live in the sediment, the water, or on eelgrass as epiphytes. So these are some diatoms here on the bottom. They have lots of different morphologies and they're a really diverse group. So in earlier research on seagrass meadows, diatoms were viewed as a bad thing because they were reducing the photosynthetic abilities of seagrass. But we now know that they play a really important role in the ecosystem. Because they perform photosynthesis, they increase the overall productivity of the ecosystem. They're also the main food source for a lot of herbivores living in eelgrass meadows, so they form the basis of the food chain. They're also very sensitive to changes in temperature, pH, and different pollutants, so whether or not they're present can tell you a lot about the water quality. They play a really important role in nutrient cycling, and they can also help prevent seagrass um, 
from dangerous things like UV radiation or drying out. So considering that diatoms have a really important role in this important ecosystem, we don't know that much about them. Overall, we lack a lot of information about what diatoms are present and where they can be found in eelgrass meadows. This is really important for us to find out because it'll help understanding of coastal ecosystems, help conserve both diatoms and seagrass meadows. And if we know what diatoms are present in healthy and stable ecosystems, we will be able to also contribute to conservation in the future. So there has been some previous research on what diatoms are present and where they can be found spatially. So overall, diatom species composition changes with depth. Uh, seagrass is found all over the world, so there are a lot of different diatoms found in different places. But even between sites in the same region, diatoms can be quite different depending on what environmental factors there are. Uh, across some studies, there are some really common uh, genera. So one of the most dominant diatoms is Coconeus. It's thought to be one of the first things that settles on eelgrass and makes a base for other things to be able to settle on. Also, there tends to be a higher density of diatoms towards the base of eelgrass leaves. So overall past research suggests there might be spatial patterns in diatom abundance, but it's still unclear exactly which taxa are present and whether taxa identity changes over different parts of the eelgrass leaf. So the first question we wanted to answer is what diatoms are present on eelgrass and how many of them are there in the Salish Sea? And the second question that we wanted to ask is whether there's different diversity and abundance on different regions of the blade. We looked at the distal region or the tip, the medial or the middle, and the proximal or the base region. So this just to see whether the eelgrass blade is more of a neutral substrate, the diatoms just settle wherever on, or whether the diatoms settle in different regions depending on morphology and environmental gradients. So our study site was Montague Harbor. Hopefully some of you have been there as I think a lot of you are probably from Galliano. There is some eelgrass out there. Um, on March 7th, 2021, 10 different eelgrass plants were sampled and two leaves were collected from each of them. And we then used these in two different kinds of analyses to see what microbes were present on the leaves. So the first one was a molecular analysis. So the three different sections uh, were swabbed and the DNA was extracted from these samples and amplified using PCR. We had three different primers to bind to the DNA and amplify. There was one for bacteria, a general one for eukaryotes, and then one specifically for diatoms. And then we sent everything to be sequenced to be able to identify what was present. So also we did a morphological analysis to double check our molecular analysis. Images were taken using a scanning electron microscope so for anyone who doesn't know what this is, it's just a really fancy microscope. It takes really great images of microscopic structures, and you can see the images that were taken on this slide here. So 10 images were taken at 500 times mag magnification um, for each of the leaf sections. And then we overlaid these grids onto the images and identified and counted the diatoms by hand. So this brings us to the results. For the molecular and the morphological data, these are the taxa that we found. On the y-axis is the relative abundance of the taxa. And then we have the base, middle, and tip regions. And on the molecular data, we also have leaves two and three. So I know that there's a lot of data on these graphs, but don't worry too much about the specifics. I'll just highlight a few of the most important taxa. So in the molecular data, the most common taxa was navicula. The second one that is in the purple is Bacillariophyceae. This is just um, diatom basically, so it wasn't specifically identified to a greater taxonomic level. And then we have Cylindrotheca and Nietzsche. And in the morphological data, the most common taxa we found were Tabularia, Coconeus, navicula, and Pererifus. So you might notice that there was a lot of mismatch on the past slide between the genera that we found. 
So these are lists of the most abundant taxa in our molecular and morphological data. So one of the important things to note here is that the most abundant taxon for our morphological data was completely absent from our molecular data. That is Coconeus. And there's also a lot of shifts in the relative abundance of taxa between these two. So then also looking at our second question, we used an inval analysis. It basically tests the associations between taxa and sites. So we wanted to see whether the diatom community was different between the base, middle, and tip. So this graph on the y-axis has a few different taxa that we found, and then the y-axis has, sorry, the x-axis has the base, middle, and tip, and some different samples. So the dots show whether something is enriched on the base, and the size of the dot is how common it was. Overall, we're not really seeing a strong pattern in this graph because the diatoms are present in all of the regions and there's just slightly more of them on the face. So overall, there's no huge differences between the tips, or, sorry, the regions. All right, so this brings us to our conclusion so far. We're still working on it, but this is what we found so far. There were no strong differences in diatom abundance and identity between spatial regions. So this might show that diatoms can settle anywhere on the blade regardless of their morphology or any environmental gradients that might be present. So additionally, we saw a big mismatch between morphological and molecular data. This could be because our PCR primers are not binding well to some of the taxa or not amplifying the DNA of some of them well. Additionally, the morphological data is definitely subject to human error because it's easy to mix up some of the diatoms. They look very similar when they're in different orientations. Also, we didn't sample as much for the morphological data because it is so much more work to go through these images manually and identify things. So we might um, have a slightly skewed view of what is present or have missed some of the rare taxa. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone from my lab and everyone from Immerse who worked on this project. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. I can take any questions now. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, are there any questions? I have a question. I do have one too. Sure. Let's go first. Great talk, Andrea. Um, I am wondering why do you think there are there's a higher abundance of diatoms on the base versus the middle and tip of the plants? Yeah, I haven't specifically looked at that in the data yet, but some previous studies have found that there were more diatoms on the base. And looking at the inval, there might be slightly more, but I haven't quite confirmed that yet. Okay, thanks. I have a question for Andrea. Mm -hmm. It's here. Hi, it's great talk. Thank you very much. And, and uh, great to see those results coming out. Um, I'm really curious about the observation of more diatoms um, at the base since uh, we've seen over and over in our SEM uh, sampling uh, the eelgrass, uh, such a quantity of diatoms at the tips, at the um, distal areas, and um, very often it's coconeus at the base, mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, quite often blades that have, or sections of, of the base or the proximal that actually don't have very many diatoms at all, so I'm very curious about that. Um, it's not, uh, like we could hear from Elaine and and uh, Arian too, it's kind of not what we're seeing uh, with our with our eyes. So it's really kind of interesting and maybe worth really looking at again. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely interesting to look at. It might be that previous studies have found that and that we won't. So it would be really interesting to actually look at the data and see what it says. Just haven't quite gotten there yet. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it might be worth looking, you know, getting together at some point and looking at at all yeah. the uh, sectional images and really taking a look at them and seeing what's what's going on there, because um, it's certainly 
certainly not what I'm I'm seeing, but yeah, but very curious results. So that's great. That's really neat. Yeah. Great talk. Thank you. Oh, I do see a question in the chat. Is there seasonality to diatom abundance on the eelgrass? So we didn't specifically look at that in our study, but other studies have found that there are differences in the diatoms between different seasons in the identity. I'm not completely sure about abundance. I think that there are differences because I think in different seasons, either the eelgrass or the diatoms would be the most common um, primary producers in the system. And I think there was a question from Laura Parfrey. Yeah, um, th thanks, Andrea. And thanks to Mark and Aryan and Elaine and all of the folks at Inmerse and Henry that have done uh, t done so much uh, on this project from the from Immerse side. I would say that I, um, I think this gives us good reason to question the molecular data. And so, so uh, the cross-referencing, and so we don't see um, the patterns that we see by eye, we don't see in the molecular data. So I would put more weight on the on the morphological data that, that we're visualizing. And um, we have some ideas on why we might see this mismatch. Um, if coconase isn't observed, then maybe we're picking up more of the sequences that are just in the water column. Definitely some of those are, are planktonic diatoms that are showing up. Um, but I don't, but I think um, from the visual observations and then also from other work where people have looked at the different sections, we don't, we certainly expect that there to be more diversity at the tips because they've had longer to settle. Um, can I, yeah, I, I agree. We find mostly a whole ton of coconeuses and not much else in one area that aren't showing up in the molecular, but there was things showing up in the molecular that we hadn't seen. So how yeah. molecular data made us look? And when we looked, there they were. It was very cool. Well, thank you. And um, unfortunately, I think we have to, we're gonna move on to the last speaker, but I see at least two more questions in the chat. So maybe the, the discussion can continue in there. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna move on. And thank you so much, Andrea. Um, so our last speaker is Mark Weber, who will be presenting on identifying diatoms for ecological research and new species reports for the Salish Sea. Thank you. Um, Andrew, do you want to run that for me? Yes, yeah, just one second. I need to transition. Don't waste, waste okay. time. It was working yesterday, but it doesn't seem to be working today. So it will take a moment here. Just one Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, can you can you hear me all? Yeah, that's good. So these are the this is a review, uh, just a presentation of our. Uh, Immerse uh, and also um, UVic and uh, UBC Salish Sea uh, Diatom projects and uh, leading the investigation, Mark Weber, Ariane Van Asselt, and Elaine Humphrey with, and we'll acknowledge volunteers later and, and also other connections. Uh, so just some pretty pictures of planktonic and benthic and uh, di epiphytic diatoms on eelgrass. Next, next one, please, Andrew. So our our overall arching project uh, goal uh, is a is the first comprehensive inventory of marine diatoms with the Salish Sea. Although there have been some other um, um, studies, uh, including one which is a PhD study in 1976 by by Shim, uh, that was only in the Georgia Strait, um, and it was mostly planktonic. So the the Salish Sea is really understudied for diatoms, and it's going to be a big job. Uh, we're sampling planktonic diatoms that float in the water, epiphytic diatoms are attached to just about anything, and benthic diatoms traditionally sitting in the mud and, and sand grains. So we're going to look at all those, which we're doing. 
So these Immerse Diatom projects, the, again, the overarching one is to create a baseline, uh, a really comprehensive inventory of marine diatoms, the genus and species level. Uh, and the other one is to look at the benthic and epiphytic diatoms on uh, eelgrass and seaweeds. So we've been doing a joint program uh, with the Power Free Lab um, on uh, the eelgrass at Montague, uh, Montague Harbour. And it's been a fascinating thing because it's most, mostly epiphytic and benthic diatoms, which can be also really challenging to look at. So these images are showing collection of planktonic diatoms, slicing up eelgrass sections to study the diatoms on them. And Elaine and myself uh, using the Tachi desktop um, microscope to uh, look at our, our, our various uh, samples and do identifications. Uh, next one, please. So why are we doing this? Well, we're doing it because, um, because of the importance of diatoms in any kind of ecological study, uh, pretty much, uh, we need to create a, a baseline, an accurate and up-to-date baseline, it just has never really been done, um, of genera and species. The baseline will allow ecologists, such as the Parfrey Lab, to understand and document the effects of habitat alterations and climate change on changing species compositions. And diatoms are, as, as Andrea mentioned, excellent indicators of specific or general environments and are used uh, really strongly in freshwater environments for, for checking uh, changes in environments and different environment conditions. And also providing data for future policy changes based on sound taxonomic and ecological information. And next one, please. So uh, diatoms are one of the largest groups of organisms on the earth, an estimated 75 to a million species. There's for sure 20, 25,000 uh, diatom species documented, about 1,200 genera. Um, some investigators uh, will say it's closer to 70,000 species. That's a bit in dispute, depends on the kind of taxonomist. Um, they're photosynthetic algae similar to plants, uh, but they're not plants. And they've emerged about 200 million years ago. Um, and they're found in every single type of water body. Next one, please. Uh, again, diatoms are major contributors to supporting life on Earth. I'm not going to go through all this. It's already happened, but uh, they contribute uh, to oxygen, organ compound, uh, organic compounds, and recycling of elements through geochemical processes. And then they contribute to about 40% of primary productivity in the global ecosystems and also in marine ecosystems, they produce about 20, 25% of the oxygen that we breathe. So uh, they're really, really important for, for, for all these studies. Next slide. Um, also diatoms are, are interdependent with other organisms. So they, diatoms are interdependent with, fungi, with fungus, viral and bacterial. Uh, organisms and also um, other uh, protests. They cover uh, the surfaces of vertebrates and invertebrates, uh, eelgrasses, and uh, these images uh, show the, the complex interactions that are going on marine habitats, also freshwater habitats. Uh, the slide, the image on the left is a chytrid inf infection uh, to Ditlum brightwellii. Uh, the next image is uh, diatoms, uh, this Achanthes elongata, uh, attaching to the surface of uh, um, um, a uh, sea turtle carapace. And we found the same species, uh, 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 quite an abundance of the same species on the eelgrass from Montague Harbor. And also uh, we find when we environmentally prepare uh, um, uh, diatoms, don't clean them from organics, we, we find here we Next uh, um, image or slide. Thank you. Next one. Thanks, Andrew. The structure of a typical diatom is uh, body's unique. The, the shell uh, is like a petri dish to half glass silica lids fitted together. And the, uh, the image is a corning petri glasses, which really very closely resemble uh, diatoms. And the image on the right is Haliodiscus uh, scotius, which we see quite often. And it's showing what the uh, petri dish lids are like. They fit in, into on, on top of each other. And they have a kind of a ring of bands, uh, a girdle bands made of silica with organic compounds that hold them together. So it's quite an interesting organism. Uh, next one. 
Um, so accurate taxonomy is essential to, good, to developing a good baseline and an inventory. Uh, traditional taxonomy is based on the patterns and the structures in these unique, unique glass cell walls. So here we have Ellerbeckia sol, uh, which is in girdle view. You can see the intricate patterns, a very complex uh, cell wall out of all the diatoms. Um, you can see the intricate patterning uh, on girdle view, side view. And when we come to the valve, which is looking from the top down, we see quite an interesting uh, valve uh, with these uh, ridges. Uh, and uh, when we go in higher magnification, uh, you can see there's one micron scale bar there, really, really complex patterning. It's this patterning and morphology that uh, distinguishes the species in the genera. Uh, next uh, next uh, um, slide, please. Thank you. So diatom morphology generally conforms really well to genera and species groupings and is closely aligned genetically, though variations do exist, uh, cryptospecies and variants, uh, in, in within different habitats, but still the gold standard, uh, we use molecular methods, but the gold standard uh, really is the detailed uh, uh, morphological investigation. Uh, morphology in tandem with molecular data gives greater confidence in tax identifications, especially the ones that are difficult to resolve by either method, especially some of the very, very small uh, diatoms which uh, can be resolved and separated using molecular methods. And then we can go in and take a good look at the morphology. And yes, we, we find the same thing in the morphology. The bottleneck we have at the moment all over the world uh, to using uh, reliable molecular methods is really a lack of cloning. That's really, you could say, lack of graduate students, lack of labs doing cloning. Uh, it's hard to do, especially with benthic and epiphytic diatoms although it's getting better, and um, also uh, uh, matching that with excellent morphological analysis and getting good long sequence uh, reads of the base pairs, and that way we can get good accurate um, analysis. This, these images on this slide are showing um, um, an example which I just did this week, which is a really good hit, molecular hit on Lichmorphora paradoxica, which is great, and a, a really nice lineup with with the species and then i looked at the images um, that we were actually sort of using for these slideshows i went aha there it is there on the same date and when i start to measure the striae and the different patterns in that diatom it pops out as lichmorphora paradoxa which so so the molecular data is really helping uh, quickly move to the morphological analysis I haven't finished this one, so I'm not convinced it's paradoxical, but it's it's looking like it, and that's a big uh, savings of time using using a combination of molecular and morphology. Uh, next slide, please. So each diatom requires microscopic examination from the valve and girdle directions. We use both light and scan electron microscopy. Here's an example of Dithlomite wellii, which really blooms at huge populations in the fall in Trichomelli Channel. There's an example looking at the girdle view. It won't tell you what species it is uh, unless you really know that, um, that genera. And then looking down or looking from this, the direction of where process is, there's the uh, valve view um, at 1,800 times magnification, and then at 12,000 magnification, we can start to see uh, characteristics which are, which are absolutely essential for separating out species. So this is a very good example, and we actually have discovered a new species. We, we have a draft paper, but we need to do some more work on that uh, before it gets published. So we found out that there, in fact, are there's probably uh, two, maybe three species hidden in Ditlin Bright Wellier in the Trincomalee Channel. Uh, next slide, please. And here's an example, really quickly. Uh, here's a diatom I've been working on uh, this last week and a half, which is uh, which I thought was Basilaria. It's a um, in the light micrographs. Uh, this is from eelgrass, but we also see it in the plankton. We see it in sand samples. Uh, it's it's moving around. It's motile. The the um, cells slide back and forth against each other. Uh, here's an electron micrograph from, uh, I think, August 20th, when we first started looking at eelgrass. And so what is this? Which genus, which diatoms? So we make a list of the characteristics that we can see 
uh, on the light micrograph, on the SCM. Um, there's a list here, which I won't go through. We look at some really nice images like this one on the, on the right side. We're guessing it's Bacillaria. Now we need to make a list of all the genus uh, characteristics from good literature, from monographs and published papers. And then we start to look at the species. Uh, next slide, please. And here we have an electron micrograph of right across three different images. And we start to, on the, on the uh, Photoshop image, we start to list the uh, genera and the species characteristics and uh, go into higher magnification so it's accurate. We, we measure all kinds of characteristics. Sometimes there's 20, sometimes there's five, sometimes there's 10, it depends on the literature. And then we eventually come up with a confident genus identification. And if we're really fortunate, we get a really confident species identification that can take anywhere between a few days, a day, a few days, and sometimes weeks when we can't find old monographs or unpublished papers. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And you see the image on the, on the left, um, which is quite old, that's from 2006, is I couldn't really identify that really well. I could get, take a guess at the, at the genus level, but uh, too much of it's obscured as a, li as a live living cell. So we need to clean them of all organic matter. The image in the middle is completely cleaned of, or of organic matter, um, mounted in a high refractive medium for light microscopy. And then we start the analysis um, of the genus and species characteristics. And we have this beautiful image uh, by, by Ron that took there um, with the SEM. I think, I think so, uh, yeah. And it's a beautiful image of the same uh, species, and therefore we can get an accurate um, species identification. So we use all these three different uh, techniques. Also, sometimes the, the number of chloroplasts and the arrangement of the chloroplasts will also indicate uh, genus and species uh, determinations. So that's really very, very helpful. So we use all these different methods. Uh, next slide, please. So what we need to do uh, is we need to um, uh, heat the diatoms, a uh, bulk or in small samples, uh, uh, usually now uh, three to five hours in concentrated hydrogen peroxide or nitric acid, or sometimes a combination of nitric and sulfuric acid to clean all the organic material off so we can do accurate taxonomy. And the, uh, the, the image uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the right is showing uh, heating uh, concentrated sulfuric acid, nitri not, sorry, nitric acid at 100 degrees for four or five hours to get all the organic material out. Uh, these three slides along the bottom show beautiful cleaning. We're just lucky. Uh, Thalassocera pacifica um, cleaned really, really well and everything's intact and we can get a really accurate um, identification. Another species there, which is actually new to the West Coast in Salish Sea, um, Thalassocera curva ceterata. Uh, we got a really good identification on that um, from good cleaning. And next slide, please. So also the, one of the best methods, which is very time consuming, is taking a single cell, uh, isolating it, uh, cleaning it in a saline, uh, uh, sorry, a clean uh, bacteria-free solution, and then growing it in a, in a, um, a sterile culture media. And then we have thousands, sometimes 50, 60,000 identical clones to look at, and we can use SEM and molecular methods. And it's a fantastic method, but it's very slow and time consuming. And every once in a while, we get to do that. And that's how we actually found two species in the Ditlam. And it's gonna, we're gonna find all kinds of new species, which we already have using this method. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So here's an example um, of with the eelgrass uh, study. And uh, we took um, uh, uh, many, many sections, actually uh, over 20 um, sections, 10, uh, 8 to 10 millimeter sections of eelgrass, and we environmentally uh, dried them out. So we, we hardly touched them. We developed the technique to dry them out so they're completely intact and very, very little loss of diatoms. And then we can go in and um, examine them uh, intact and also use it for counting methods. And so far with the eelgrass project from Montague Harbor from March 2021, but also from five or six different samplings, we have found 
uh, actually this is old, we're, we're now up to 70 genera and 89 species. We, we've hardly begun to look at the species, but we've looked because of the, the need for the analysis of the Power Free Lab. We're mostly looking at the genera. We have um, about 70 genera morphologically found, but we have about 10 to 13. Um, I, I just changed this this morning because there's new numbers, but um, 10 to 13 different genera that have um, been found only through molecular methods and good, good, good hits. I really like the signals, but we have not seen them in the light or the SEM images. Uh, I'm sure they're there. They're small and they're very hard to find, but we will find them. And I do trust most of that molecular data because uh, I know the labs that did the morphological work and they're, it's really good. Um, as, as Laura said, and Andrea said, is there's a whole bunch of diatoms genera that were not picked up um, molecularly and, and um, especially Coconea, Sucjanthes and Rocosphenia. And here's an example on this, um, uh, a, a 10 millimeter uh, section of eelgrass is right in the middle. There's one colony out of all this uh, 10 millimeter section of Lycmorphora. It's sitting right there in the middle. And I took a, an image of that. And uh, it just shows you that on a uh, 10 millimeter section, uh, and this is a, a distal section, a tip, uh, there's only one colony of Lycmorphora in that entire section. So, but Lycmorphora was picked up in the molecular data. Uh, next slide, please. So results, to date, the Salish Sea Diatom Inventory, including the Ilgrass survey and the beginning now of, sea, of, of seaweed, of, uh, um, not sea, uh, seaweed in um, uh, Retreat Cove, Galliano Island. Uh, we so far are up to 90 genera. Uh, we have one undescribed new genera called periraphis like um, which some one day uh, hopefully will be published. We have some excellent images and uh, the first live images of periraphis. Um, uh, hopefully that will be published in the next number of years. Uh, we're now up to 164 species. Uh, in the last year, we've grown by about 40% new species identified in, a, in the last year. And we have four to five undescribed new species when I was with Andreas Witowski, who's a who just passed away, but a worldwide a world expert in diatoms, uh, every once in a while under the microscope uh, and SEM images, he would just say, "That's a new species." No, oh, that's a new species. Uh, so we have we'll have lots of species, new species coming out of it that never seen before. And you can keep uh, looking at new postings on iNaturalist. This link uh, where we post our uh, uh, research uh, results and new species and new genera results from our study of the Salish Sea. Uh, next slide, please. And what we're seeing also is warmer water species of diatoms showing up. I have a partial list um, uh, up for you. Uh, these are some examples. We have way more, but we're seeing more and more uh, diatoms that, that have been identified in California, Mexico, um, in southern waters. Uh, some have never been seen in the Pacific uh, at all, but uh, so far we can document ones that have never been seen in Western Canada marine waters or have ever been found in the Salish Sea. And this is a partial list and it's growing. So um, these are all new records. And these are some images of these new records of, 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 uh, of diatoms that are warm water diatoms, probably due to climate change and also due to freighter traffic, um, but certainly due to climate change. Uh, we have a whole bunch of under-identified taxa. Um, uh, here's a list of, I think, 11. Just, I just popped these on. 11 uh, diatom genera that we really haven't looked at closely, both in the eelgrass study and in the planktonic study. And we're going to find um, 10 to 30 species, maybe more, 40 species in some of these. So we're looking at uh, two to 300 to 400 more species that we're going to have to identify out there, we know they're there, and that's a partial list. And uh, so we've just passed on the, the, some of our conclusions. We're making good progress in making a comprehensive inventory of diatoms within the Salish Sea. Uh, the eelgrass study and the Phalastocera survey uh, are showing that the combination of molecular work and morphological characteristics is really speeding up identifications. 
Uh, we've got way more sampling to do all through the South Sea. We've mostly focused on Galliano Island. And with enough sampling, the data will be useful as a platform for many ecological studies, environmental change, analysis, expanding the inventory of diatoms, microalgae, zooplankton, and other organisms. We have a growing, uh, we have hundreds of slides now of clean diatoms that's growing uh, and organized, uh, being inventoried. And we also have hundreds of stubs of uh, diatoms diatoms for electron microscopy. And the last slide, uh, many thanks to our team, Elaine Hemphrey and myself, uh, Siobhan uh, at the Parfrey Lab, Lara Parfrey, uh, Arian, uh, Melanie, uh, who, uh, and Ron, who take uh, great images uh, at UVic, uh, Raphael Hoekstra, who joins us once a year and helps us with uh, images and collecting and, and uh, cooking diatoms and um, also the, the new uh, students uh, who are studying uh, the eelgrass and diatoms, uh, like Andrea at uh, the Parfrey Lab. And we want to thank Hitachi uh, High Tech for loaning uh, the uh, tabletop SEM to Elaine, so we can um, do lots of studies with that. And uh, I want to thank uh, all of you and the team who've taken great images and really helped with this uh, project and also our collaborators. It's so wonderful a joint collaboration between Immerse and uh, university researchers. So that's it. Also, there's a 20, 25 minute presentation, which is longer and more detailed, which um, I've asked Andrew to post, um, which is way more detailed than this with uh, both how we do it and results and morphological analysis, which hopefully will be found on the Immerse website or YouTube channel. Thank That's it. So much. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, we're running a little tight on time now, so I maybe if there are questions, maybe that the conversation could continue in the chat, if that's all right. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, but thank you all. We really appreciate all the work that you're doing, and we look forward to hearing updates on all of your projects. And um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, yeah, we will have the recording. Um, Yes. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to Emily, our chair, for heading into the AGM proceedings. Hi, everyone, and thanks to David, Andrea, and Mark for their great presentations. It's really nice to learn more about the research happening in the Salish Sea. So I'd like to call our annual general meeting to order and start by taking attendance. So I think we are going to... Emily, I can say I actually have reviewed all the numbers so far and we do have quorum, so you don't have to go through, because I actually just went through everyone's name here in the background. Okay, perfect. There are There's 26 members present. I believe quorum is 21, so we're good to go. Okay, great. Thanks for checking that out, Andrew. Okay, so we do have quorum. And next up is... Um, I'd like to motion to adopt the agenda for today. I'll second that. Pam seconds. Okay. Is there anyone um, not in favor of adopting today's agenda? No, nope? okay, motion carried. And then I'd like to move to adopt the minutes from last year's AGM. I'll second that, Emily. Okay. And again, is there anybody who is not in favor of adopting last year's minutes? Okay, no, doesn't seem like it. Motion carried as well. So the first thing that I'd like to go over is this year we took some time to review our purposes of corporation and revise them to align with where we are headed as an organization. Um, additionally, we are applying for a charitable status and we want to ensure that our purposes align with the Canada Revenue Agency requirements. And so we, um, we revise the purposes to specifically focus on advancing education. And so I'll go through each of our revised purposes now. 
The first is to increase capacity for long-term ecological research in the Salish Sea by connecting communities with technological resources, research facilities, and place-based knowledge and expertise. To share knowledge and engage the public in research through educational activities, community science, and creative expression to collect and provide open access to data on biodiversity and ecological change in support of regional conservation and climate adaptation efforts. And lastly, to promote collaborative research practices by developing and maintaining a network of multidisciplinary cross-cultural and trans-boundary relationships. Um, and this document was sent out to everybody in the AGM announcement. And at this point, I would like to motion to adopt the purposes of corporation as amended. I'll second that. Pam seconds. Are there any opposed or abstaining votes for this? Okay, it doesn't seem like it. So motion carried, which is great, it's exciting. And another big thing that we did this year was working on updating our bylaws. Um, so we wanted them to be more aligned with our goal of growing Emirates membership and increasing board of director capacity. And so the main changes to our bylaws are as follows. We updated the bylaw language to be inclusive of all genders. We additionally removed the membership cap of 60 people to have no membership cap. And again, that's to increase capacity of members. And then lastly, we, lastly, we increased the maximum number of directors from nine to 12 to increase capacity on the board of Immerse. And then we also revised some of the language in the bylaws to improve clarity. Okay, so I'd like to motion to adopt the bylaws as amended. And again, the bylaw revisions have been, um, they were sent out in the email for the AGM announcement, so you should have access to them. Um, so are there, so I'd like to motion to adopt these bylaws. I'll second that. And pan seconds. Are there any opposed or abstaining votes for this? Okay, it doesn't seem like it. Motion carried. Great, thanks everyone. I can now pass it on to Kieran, who will go over the year end financial report. Thank you, Emily. The most exciting part of the of the meeting, the numbers. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go through it fairly briefly. If there are questions, maybe we can address them at the end, or we can, um, yeah, we'll see. Um, so, I one thing I want to address right from the top. This is um, the financial report for last financial year, which only goes up until March 31st of this year the end of the financial year so we're quite a bit behind that now um that's why I, after this i've also attached a year-to-date report um but as our agm requirements this is just la last financial year um so i've got the income here um a lot of this is uh, money that was allocated for the Hetikum project and then um and then went went towards that as well um one thing that I want to point out here, we have we made less than uh, fifty thousand in in revenue, so we we are not required to do an audit um, yet. And I think this this year that we're in right now will be in the same um, category as well. We'll stay below that as well. Saves us a lot of work. And next slide, please. Um, and that's our expenses. Um, contract service here is is head to come basically. Um, 
almost exclusively. Um, it's named a little bit differently than up in the in the previous slide, but that's basically where all that money went that we got in grants for for Hitacom. Um, and uh, yeah, net income for the for the last financial year was about ten thousand. Um, so we did pretty well um, with uh, with regards to to our um, to our balance. I think that's it for here. Um, and yeah, I would like to motion to adopt the 2022-2023 financial report. Um, and I think you all had a chance to look at it. Or, uh, it was sent out with the, with the agenda. So um, I'd like to motion for it here. Sorry. I'll second that motion. Um, Emily, do you want to handle the, the voting or should I? Sure, I can handle it. Um, are there, is there anybody who abstains or does not vote yes on this? Okay, it doesn't seem like it, so motion carried. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, and now, now I just got a overview of, of this year. As I said, we're more than halfway through this year already. Um, so I, I just, this is a summary up to, up to um, the beginning of November. Um, and by, by next AGM, we'll have a full report of the year. Um, I think one thing to point out here again is sort of, um, donations and fundraising income uh, similar to last, to the previous year but we we did really well in our fundraising campaign uh this year we the fundraising line here is about 6700 which is mostly from the from the kayaking fundraisers it's a fantastic outcome from from this year's um fundraiser so just wanted to highlight that um and then if you want to go to the next slide our expenses again um we, we're still like doing we're still on the plus but we're, we're having a the net income is a bit lower this year but we're also not quite through the year yet um there are a couple things um that i wanted to highlight um or one thing really uh insurance i think we just went out this year again for for board insurance and we're going to have to look at getting insurance for um doing another fundraiser next year so there are some upcoming expenses that might might still fall into this year but they're not reflected here yet um and i think that's pretty much it all i got to say if there are questions i don't know if we have time Hannah, or emily or or not but we can I have one or two here. I think we have time for one or two questions if there are any. Okay, no questions. I think we can move on to the next part then. I guess, I suppose that's my part. And uh, well, thanks, Karen, for that riveting overview of immersed finances. I'm sure that's why most people are here today to, just to hear that we're in good financial standing. That's great. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us at our AGM today, everyone. It means a lot to see a good turnout among our membership as well as the broader community. Uh, for my part of this presentation, I'm going to provide a brief summary of some of the major activities that took place for Immerse over the last year. And um, going, I think I thought it made sense since we've uh, recently reviewed and revised our um, purposes, which I'm glad to see were passed as special resolutions today. I thought I'd, I'd sort of organize my slides, um, summarizing each, each of these activities um, underneath the banner of our purposes, just so that our membership can see the, those links between um, these initiatives and our mandate. So. First, to promote collaborative research practices by developing and maintaining a network of multidisciplinary, cross-cultural, and transboundary relationships. Um, 
this year, I think the main feature is uh, the gathering that took place down in Lummi territories in Washington. Several Immerse um, members got the opportunity to participate in this. Uh, it was organized by in, uh, our partner, an Indigenous-led NGO, White Swan Environmental, and it was focused on building relationships around uh, their digital ecocultural mapping project. Immerse is uh, now several years into a pilot project here on Galliano that's focusing on Hethakum. You heard Kieran recommend, uh, reference that a moment ago. Um, and this is just a small part of this broader initiative that White Swan Environmental is leading. So the purpose of this gathering was to learn more about White Swan Environmental's vision for this work and to strengthen the relationships that will support it in the longer term, given their goal of mapping out culturally significant sites in Strait Salish territories. And so we're, we're really, really grateful to White Swan Environmental for bringing us all together for this important gathering and as well our partners at the Inclusive Design Research Center who helped us secure a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council Connection Grant, uh, which made it possible for us all to participate in this event. So um, yeah, we all came together, we, not just to talk about the vision for eco-cultural mapping in Salish Sea, but more importantly, really, we came together to share food. Um, we came together to learn about several culturally significant sites in Lummi territories, such as Pepiawe, that's English camp on San Juan Island. And really to connect with the lands and waters that are so vital to sustaining these relationships among Strait Salish and other Coast Salish peoples. So in short, these were really critical bonding experiences that are vital to supporting these cross-cultural collaborations in the longer term and ultimately White Swan Environmental's vision to restore uh, connections to ancest their ancestral ho homelands. And uh, Shirley was going to be here today. Unfortunately, she couldn't. Um, I was going to ask her to speak, but if anyone uh, here was present and able to participate in this, I'd just welcome you to speak to that experience. It was really meaningful and kind of hard to put words to, uh, especially briefly providing an overview in a presentation like this. But yeah, you're, you're welcome. I think Hannah um, Anternig, I think I saw is here. If you'd like to just share your own personal experience. Let me know. I'll give you a moment too. I'm happy to share. I didn't um don't know if Andrew made but I'll just um mention something first. Um yeah, it was a really incredible experience. And I think it really um emphasized the importance of relationships, as Andrew was saying, and also place-based connection and that relationships take time to build and, and that that often happens through shared experience in place as well as um, time to listen, hear stories, hear um, about people's experiences and, and uh, yeah, to be able to kind of share a more like immersed time together in like, uh, yeah, rather than, you know, we do a lot of Zoom meetings and but it's really nice to be able to connect in the places that are meaningful to what we're talking about and trying to work towards. So, yeah, that's what I would share. Thanks, Hannah. Um, yeah, and uh, Anthony, you're welcome if you would like to share. I'm not sure if you're there. Let's give you. I'm, a... yep, yep. I'm, I'm right here. Just, yes, wanted to echo what Hannah said and, and just emphasize how important and, and moving the, the transboundary gathering of of this autumn was um, a chance for me and my family to meet members of Immerse for the first time in person who I've been working with for so many years. It was very uh, touching and, and moving to sort of give a reality to places like like Hethikun and to, to sit and, and paddle there and, and indeed to have a, a sort of place-based reality to this to this work and to, to see the powerful networks of, of connections across many cultures that are uh, steadily knitting together around uh, this multidisciplinary ecological work and so yes I'm yeah, very grateful for the opportunity to be to be amongst you all and and help with uh, bringing this work forward awesome Antrenic. and yeah just on a personal note too it was awesome to see and connect just with Antrenic we've been working together for six years and and he's all the way on the other side of the pond there 
in London. Um, so yeah, that was our first time actually meeting in person and in a, a lot of very special places. So yeah, I'll move on. Thanks, Antronig. Um, so yeah, in connection with this purpose as well, I'll speak to just a few more of the collaborative relationships and connections that we're currently exploring. Uh, Immerse for the last year has been a formal partner in the Hakai Northeast Pacific Coastal Biodiversity Action Network. Uh, so we've been participating in regular monthly steering committee meetings. We organize a big bio blitz, which we'll speak to shortly. And uh, yeah, we just, we're continuing to collaborate toward efforts fostering action-oriented conservation and management throughout the Salish Sea, which is what this network is all about. And we're really grateful for this opportunity to participate in this initiative because it's just so perfectly complementary to the vision and mission of Immerse. Uh, Immerse is also participating in a community of practice involving the Saanich Leadership Council and Rain Coast Conservation Foundation, as well as other organizations active in the region. Um, this community of practice is fairly new. It's focused on regional capacity building in support of priorities that are being set by members of the Saanich nations, um, primarily looking to create opportunities for access to food, which is so vital to community health and well-being. And just in the, as in the case with our work with White Swan Environmental, of course, we recognize these relations ta relationships take a lot of time to build trust and to learn to work together respectfully and in culturally safe ways. So um, these conservation, or sorry, these conversations really are only just beginning and we're really grateful and humbled to have the opportunity to participate in this community of practice. Uh, the Pacific Salmon Foundation, uh, we connected with representatives of the Pacific Salmon Foundation and the Strait of Georgia Data Center some time ago uh, in our efforts to share baseline biodiversity data, which we've been generating. And we found this common purpose in our mission to promote open access to these data. And so we continue to meet periodically and we're, we're still exploring opportunities for collaboration. <clears throat> We've been working with Transition Salt Spring for some years now in a partnership focused on the co-development of open source data science frameworks. Uh, the context of this work is the Maxwell Creek Watershed Restoration Project being led by Transition's Climate Adaptation Research Lab on Salt Spring Island. Uh, and this is just a glimpse at the story mapping framework we've been developing together. This collaborative project has afforded opportunities to bootstrap development of these frameworks, uh, which are evolving in multiple different contexts. Uh, so the outcomes of this work are directly benefiting our work in several other contexts at the same time. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the work of the Access to Media Education Society, who have contributed uh, in a really big way to our initiatives this year. This organization does lots of fabulous work, inspiring positive change through media arts, but they also have a, a mandate for community capacity building that has enabled some really meaningful collaborations on our ongoing ecocultural mapping projects. Um, Te Tatari, Teyari, my, sorry about that. Uh, he's a youth intern working with Ames and Immerse, and he's made huge contributions to our ongoing ecocultural mapping pilot projects. And Ames has also contributed to capacity building in our community through mentorship and support of Janine Jordison, who has been leading several Immerse projects over the past few years. So the next purpose, moving along, um, I'll speak to our purpose to share knowledge and engage the public in research through educational activities, community science, and creative expression. Uh, actually, I've been speaking for long enough now, I think, so I'm actually going to invite Elaine Humphrey, uh, who's another Immerse Director, to speak briefly about our insights into the Salish Sea event, if you're there, Elaine. Yep, uh, I'm here, uh, but you, you have... I'm going to look at, oh, we're not using the SEM yet, are we? No, that's for later. Yeah, no, this is just this particular event, just to share your, a bit about your experience. At the oh, um, I think we should leave that till the end when we actually use the SEM. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, we, yeah, just in brief, we organized this lovely event at the Galliana Library. Elaine came out, she brought oh, all that her... one. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought we were looking at something else. Yeah. So I brought the SEM over to Galliano and a whole bunch of activities to go with light microscopes. And with the help of Janine and um, her son, Austin, and 
the library staff, it was a great time. We had a lot of fun. But then we always have a lot of fun with the SEM. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, there was also a great exhibit set up uh, featuring lots of uh, images from Mark's and Parfrey Labs diatom research. And so, yeah, just thank to like, thanks to Libby McClelland and the Gallagher Conservancy and folks on our operations committee for helping to bring this together. It was a great event. And then I suppose the hallmark for the year under this purpose was this BioBlitz that we organized in partnership with the Hakai Institute, the Galliano Conservancy, and the Henderson Farm Community on Galliano. Um, this was organized through the BioAcnet initiative I mentioned earlier, and it was part of the Hethikum Ecocultural Mapping Project. Uh, so it had support from the Indigenous Watersheds Initiative and Capital Regional District, as well as support from UBC Bright intern Maggie Sline, who has been working with us for quite some time now uh, through the Bright Internship Program. The event brought together over 100 people to take part in biodiversity surveys that spanned both terrestrial and marine environments around the island. Uh, here's a few of the teams that came, one from Hakai, um, uh, research, uh, members of research groups at the University of British Columbia, as well as the University of Alberta. Here's one of the, the recreational dive teams that got out. Altogether, there were eight teams. Here's the Hakai, one of the Hakai dive teams in Retreat Cove. Um, this is the lab that Hakai set up at the Galliano Library. So that was a really amazing thing. I barely got to participate into myself, but um, Laura Parfrey was there and Mark and all the folks working on the diatom work. Yeah, all in all, there were eight different teams operating during the BioBlitz for nearly four days. So it was a really dynamic event with a lot of activity. Uh, we're still in the process of gathering results from the, these events. And so we're not really in a position to report outcomes yet, but we will definitely share uh, with our membership when we can. So our third purpose is to increase capacity for long-term ecological research in the Salish Sea by connecting communities with technological resources, research facilities, place-based knowledge and expertise. Um, I'm gonna share outcomes of a local biodiversity project that sort of falls under the banner of Immerse here on Galliano Island, the Biodiversity Galliano Project, uh, which has been ongoing since 2016. So it actually predates Immerse, but it's now an official Immerse project. Um, yeah, huge progress over the last six years. Now, nearly 4,500 species known to the island, including nearly 3,000 historical records of which we've now confirmed 57% of that historically reported biodiversity and now added uh, just over 1700 new species to the island. Um, it's a very brief overview of just a huge amount of data that we've been collating. Um, and I'm sharing these summary statistics, not only because they speak to the impressive efforts that are being made to catalog Galliano Island's community or biodiversity, um, but because they also speak to the model frameworks we've been creating for community-based biodiversity research, which we are actively working to replicate in collaborations with communities throughout the region. These frameworks have, um, they, we've developed them. Um, they've informed studies that have enabled us to detect significant changes in the local biodiversity. For example, we have, we've seen a dramatic change in the local bumblebee community historically. Um, this research has been, in press or in review for quite some time, but it's actually it should appear next month in the journal Northwest Science. So it's a bit premature to share that, but that's a, an outcome um, that shows how this ongoing community science um, initiative has been informing ongoing research, uh, at detecting biodiversity change. And these frameworks recently, they've reached a pretty advanced stage of maturation, as in the case of this atlas. I wish I had time to actually poke at it with you. Um, but it, yeah, this marine atlas summarizes the outcomes of over a century and a half of marine biodiversity research around Galliano. And with this visualization tool, which we really haven't even started playing with yet, but we're now in a position to engage the community in targeted search efforts to detect historically reported species and otherwise to begin closing gaps in our knowledge of the local marine biodiversity. I was chatting with Zeus, if he's still here, uh, just last night about how we should get together and play with this and plan getting out together to dive on this weekend. So we can see if we can 
track down some of the species that are historically known that we haven't seen for some time. Hmm. Um, yeah, our vision is to expand on these frameworks um, with and to network biodiversity projects throughout the Salish Sea. And I'm happy to report that through the collaborations I mentioned earlier, which we're forming with groups like the Hakai Institute and the Pacific Salmon Foundation, we are coming closer and closer to realizing this long-term vision. <clears throat> uh, finally, our purpose to collect and provide open access to data on biodiversity and ecological change in support of regional conservation and climate adaptation efforts. Well, so many of our initiatives meet this purpose, but I'll speak to it briefly to a few of the highlights. Um, last year, we we shared uh, that we published an open access data set uh, in the Biodiversity Data Journal, which establishes a formal baseline record of the marine animal diversity reported around Galliano Island. And I was just checking it as I was preparing these slides and found that the data set has so far been cited by 43 publications and has been accessed over 8,000 times through the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, the next installment in this data paper series will focus on the marine algae reported for the island and the broader Salish Sea, drawing on the research of Mark and Parfrey Lab and the Hakai Institute, which you got to hear about this morning. Um, and as Mark mentioned, uh, this, this will be not just an inventory of Galliano's um, diatoms, but also really the first um, major effort to synthesize information on the diatoms of the Salish Sea overall. Another great example of our work promoting open access to biodiversity data science is the Janssen Legacy Project. Um, we heard about reference to Harvey earlier. Uh, he was an accomplished amateur botanist and naturalist who during his career collected over 3,000 vascular plant specimens, mostly from the Southern Gulf Islands, but really also obsessively was involved in just curating comprehensive species lists, documenting the flora of the Gulf Islands, the San Juans, as well as the Saanich Peninsula. Um, Immerse recently had the opportunity to collaborate with Dr. Diane Srivastava and Dr. Mike Lavender at the Canadian Institute for Ecology and Evolution on an event called a hackathon, which was focused on basically transcribing Harvey's field notes. Um, this was funded through the Living Data Project. Our, our team included a dozen undergraduates and several graduate students from UBC who got to spend time at the beautiful Chikama Center in Squamish, focusing on preserving this really important legacy biodiversity data set. This work will establish an important baseline data set of the region's vascular plant diversity with implications for conservation in the face of climate change and other anthropogenic impacts on this landscape. And we, we really want to thank, uh, of course, the Canadian Institute for Ecology and Evolution, as well as the intern Emma Mentions, who worked with us on developing a protocol for transcribing Harvey's journals. Here's a picture of Emma with Dr. Diane Srivastava. And Emma again with Mike Lavender, who she worked closely with. All right, well, I'm very close to finishing up my part in this presentation, um, but the last thing I'll speak to is something Kieran also mentioned, uh, the outcomes of our recent fundraiser. This year, we organized the second annual Paddle Along for Biodiversity, and we were successful in raising nearly $7,000 for Immerse. Um, and we also met our goal. We exceeded our goal. I think it was 350 species documented along the way on this weekend. Well, this, yeah, I think a couple days out on the water. Uh, we actually, I think, ended up documenting 400 species. So we're setting a pretty high bar for doing this again. Um, with the success of this fundraiser, I, I think there's agreement in among the board that this was successful and worthwhile continuing. Um, not only is it being effective for raising some funds for the organization, but we think it's an inspiring way just to connect with the Salish Sea and its biodiversity, which is, you know, really at the heart of the work that we're doing. So, oh yeah, here's a diatom. If Are you still there, Mark? Um, this was actually collected not this year, but last year during our kayaking fundraiser. So we brought a plankton net along with us and we collected some plankton samples and then Mark did that fastidious work of slowly sorting it out. I don't know how long it took, but uh, here's a diatom that we collected during one of our paddle along 
uh, yeah, last year's paddle along and um, turned out to be a new species for the Sailor Sea. Yep. Of course, yeah. So many thanks to our many donors and sponsors to who um, gave us the push we need to continue this work. And with that, I'll pass it back off to our chair, Emily, to give us some an outlook over the next year, what we have planned. Thanks so much for that overview, Andrew. It's, it's exciting to see all the activities that you accomplished over the past year. And I'm going to introduce the activities we have planned for the coming year. So charitable status has been a strategic priority for Immerse since last year. This AGM marks an important moment in our progress toward that goal with adoption of our revised articles of incorporation. Um, we have also contracted support from a consultant, Keith Erickson, to help us expedite this process. He's been a huge help. And with an application, um, he's working on helping us with an application being prepared for submission by early next year. So that'll be a big milestone for us once we reach that. Gaining charitable status will allow us to grant charitable tax receipts to our donors and will place us in a good position to pursue one of our more ambitious medium-term goals, which is to establish a community lab and collaboration center on Galliano Island. With the amendments to our bylaws, we are also aiming to increase capacity on the board of Immerse. And as of this year, we have a solid organizational structure with well-defined roles and responsibilities for each of our directors. We are looking forward to assembling our team for the next year with a set of candidates nominated to fulfill these roles as officers and committee chairs. This coming year, we will aim to both expand our membership and our board of directors to increase capacity and organization. And we will also continue to foster our regional partnerships which Andrew spoke to earlier. Also a big milestone is this coming year, we will see the culmination of the Hethicum Eco-Cultural Mapping Pilot Project, which has been ongoing for the last three years. This has been an important and sensitive work in collaboration with White Swan Environmental and other indigenous community members. This project has proceeded slowly as we carefully establish the trust and relationships necessary to fulfill this work. And because of the sensitivity of this work, we have not yet shared much about the Hethicum project, but we look forward to sharing the outcomes of this pilot project with the community in the spring of 2024. We will continue to work with White Swan Environmental to envision ways of adapting the eco-cultural mapping framework we've created to serve their vision. Lastly, we are in conversation with communities throughout the region about the possibility of organizing a biodiversity summit. At the summit, we hope to establish the community foundation for a bioregional atlas of Sailor Sea biodiversity. The vision for an atlas of Sailor Sea biodiversity has been central to our work since we founded Immerse. Given our growing network of partnerships, which includes biodiversity projects throughout the region, we are hopeful about the possibility of realizing this vision in years to come. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to thank our membership and the many volunteers and donors who have supported Immerse over the last three years. We truly would not be here without you. In 2024, as we mentioned, we will seek to expand membership and grow our community with more opportunities for engaging in our projects. If you'd like to be involved in Immerse, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at info at immerse.org. And with that, I would like to pass it back to Elaine Humphrey. Hi. Okay, so I need to share the um, screen. Um, so I need to go here. And I'm going to share this SEM screen. Um, so Andrew asked me to do five minutes of SEM. 
and what I'm working on at the moment. And what I'm working on at the moment are sponges. So sponges, we have about um, 17 or 18 species, just about to get 33 more. And when you digest away the organic material, you're left with the spicules. So this particular one I know as number 385. And it's spicules, when you look, these are all silica. So we have a whole new language. Oh, too, too high. Um, so these long ones are called styles. And then we have these round one here is called sig sigmas. And every now and again, we get some diatoms in there because they tend to feed on diatoms. So here we have a diatom. Oops. No, I need to go this way. But then this what this is, because it's only what's left after the diatom has had a go on it. So we'll go autofocus. And we'll see what we've got. Any ideas, Mark? Just waiting for it to emerge. Well, kind of looks like like Pedosa or Halodiscus. That's really cool. It'd be great to get a really crisp, clear image of that on the inside. So, yes, look does does look like that. Maybe even uh, Pedosa because of the little lines on the inside of the valve. Great, thanks, Elaine. Cool. We, we get a lot of species of diatoms in these that we don't actually see in our uh, our specimens on the yeah. Um, yeah. But here, remember I said there's a whole new uh, language? These are isochelos, and there's three kinds of isochelos in this particular sponge. This is the large one. And if I go back to where we were, there's the little one. Let me zoom into that one. Oh no, this is the medium one. Oops. Uh, a medium sized one. And then here is the little one. Whoops, I gotta bring it. It's like patting your head and rubbing your tummy, getting the stage in the right place. And this is the little one and it's got a little spike on its head. So its head is coming this way. Um, and then there's, so these are isochelas, and then there was one, or oh here, one more. And that's about, right? So the, these are called signals. Oh, and there's a piece of cotton that's got on there. Uh, I think that's completely an artifact of something. So here, here's a sigma, and, and it's not flat. It's a very curved and 3D effect. And there's one of the little ones and there's a big one. And so we end up looking through and Ron and Melanie are my help on these. Ron does most of it uh, until we've got all the things together. And then we, uh, oh, let me stop sharing this one and share my screen here. Um, so on my screen, you can see another one. This is number 300. I only know it by its its number. And you can see it's got these wonderful ones here, acanthus styles and uh, tour notes and styles. Um, and we're putting plates together. This guy is 313. So Neil McDaniel has been doing the light microscope. He's did the collecting and he photographed them in situ. And then... Um, if I get rid of this one, I need to minimize that one. Yeah, so we're putting plates together. We've now got the, the thing all together. This is 407 and you can see 407. So we get the light microscope pictures that here with the spicules on and then the SEM pictures. So this one's got styles. Acanthus styles with the knobby head. 
if I can make that a bit bigger. It's got the knob. Oh. No, 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 don't do that. <laughs> uh, and there's two kinds. There's a 150 micron one and then a 50 micron one. And they're really spiky. And then the isokilos, a different kind of isokilo this time. And then um, this one, which isn't a sigma, a toxa. Yeah. So um, it's been a whole bunch of um, sharing. I think that's... Um, Elaine, before you stop, I, I love how your explorations always begin with like the microscopic view of things and then kind of zoom out. But for those of us who are perplexed as to what in the world a sponge is, maybe you can share a little bit about what we just actually were looking at. <laughs> oh, there's some people, don't people know what sponges are? Oh, well, if you go to the beach and you see, um, let me have a look in my Zoom. They're, they're um, simple animals that live on, here we go. I gotta share my this screen, one second. I've got to go here and share, share screen, um, this screen. So oh, this orangey mess here, you know, people know what sponges are, they use them in, well, no, they used to use them in baths where a loofah was a sponge. But ours are very small. Ours are much smaller. There's a barnacle sitting on this one. But they feed by filter feeding. So they feed on a lot of diatoms. And we get a lot of diatoms in them that don't dissolve in the, in the nitric acid. And so we clean them the same way as the diatoms because they're mostly the the spicules that we find are made of um, silica. There are some with calcium carbonate silica uh, ones, and we don't use nitric acid on those because otherwise we dissolve, dissolve the spicules as well. So I've been working on a calcium carbonate one with um, somebody from Calgary University who works at Banfield. And that we're there, we're, look, we're looking at the sponge larvae because this particular sponge larva has eye spots but only for a very short time till it finds its area to sink down to onto to grow on the bottom um but that you've got a very limited lot time scale to get it so she was there in Banfield when they were all spawning happily and so we've got lots of and those larvae. Um, it, it's a wonderful world when you've got an electron microscope. So if anybody wants to look at something because this is a, a open source type of microscope, they have to bring it along and we'll have a look at it. That's it. I was allowed five minutes and there you are. <laughs> Thanks, Em. Thanks, Lynn. Oops. Back to Emily. Thanks, Elaine. It was really fun to see that SEM. Always enjoy that. Um, at this point, I would like to um, motion to adopt the reports as presented by directors. I'll second that motion. Okay, is there anyone who would like to abstain or is opposed to the reports? Okay, seems like a no. Motion carried. Okay, now we're moving on to the last bit of the AGM where we are electing our directors. It's an exciting time. So I would first start to like, I would first like to thank directors for their service. Um, myself, Hannah Carpendale, Kieran Hohendorf, Helene Humphrey, Pam Jansen, Andrew Simon, and Ruth Aldick for their service over the past couple of years. 
And I would like to give a very special thanks to Pam Jansen, our former treasurer who has completed her term and is stepping down from the board. We will miss you a lot, Pam. She was instrumental in spearheading our all things finance and also took on other roles like handling memberships. And so we will miss you a lot. I'll miss you guys too. But I won't. We know where it's <laughs> Yeah. Because we're going to be working on uh, simuls. Yes, we are. I also have a glass sponge if you would like a piece of it to look at. Yes, always. I have okay. some, I have some slime molds to send you, Pam, right here. Oh, please do. <laughs> I'll trade you for the really big book of everything that I have. Mm. That binder. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the election will be officiated by Mike Colwell. And I think he's on this call. You should be here. I am. Okay, hello, Mike. Um, and here are the photos for the nominees for the 2024 Board of Immers. So in addition to the directors I already listed, we also have um, Kendall McLaughlin, Kevin Toomer, and Laura Jimenez up for election. Okay. Um, if uh, you're turning it over to me, uh, Emily, yes. is that turning it go? over to you at this point? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. For, first of all, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, um, all the, the presenters and uh, for really interesting um, presentations and, uh, you know, Andrew and uh, for the report on all the activities. I mean, I, I've been following comments in the chat and uh, it's truly impressive what Immerse has been able to do in terms of partnerships and uh, community engagement. So congratulations to Immerse. So uh, for this, this part of the agenda, it is the election of directors and under the current bylaws, uh, Immerse um, can have up to nine directors. And uh, the terms of the directors, the current bylaws allow terms up to three years, but it has been recommended that for the uh, for this election, for this AGM, that uh, the terms be either one or two years. And I understand, and Andrew, can you confirm that among the nine folks that you see here on the screen, um, that it's been sorted out that uh, uh, six of them would be serving two-year terms uh, or running for or standing for two-year terms and three for one-year terms. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And so it's intended to set up a stagger and we've just expanded the board to 12 directors who we would elect at the next AGM. So there should be a good stagger between those two and one-year terms. Yeah, and as you pointed out, you've adopted new bylaws, but those not are not in effect at this AGM. So that'll be for your next year. So it is a nine member board of directors to be elected. The list I have uh, indicates that for, uh, we have nominees for two-year terms being Andrew, Emily, Ruth, Kieran, Laura, and Elaine. And for one-year terms being Kendall, Kevin and Hannah. Um, and if there's if any of that's wrong, uh, please sp somebody speak up and uh, let us know. Seeing nothing. So there are nine nominees for nine director positions, but it's also possible for people to be nominated uh, from the meeting here. Uh, if uh, any additional uh, folks are uh, nominated, then we will need to uh, hold uh, an election. And Emily, I believe, has uh, arranged a form that we could use should there be any additional nominees. So as per tradition and uh, rules of order, I will call for any additional nominees and I will call three times. So this is the first call. Are there any additional nominees 
for election to the Board of Directors of Immerse. Calling a second time, are there any additional nominees for uh, election to the directors? And again, I can't see everyone. I'm hoping somebody can see if anybody has raised anything, anything in the chat or anything. Um, and and for a third time, are there any additional further nominees for election to the board of Immerse for the coming year? Seeing none, this makes things quite straightforward. I therefore move that the nine individuals be elected by acclamation for the term lengths as previously specified. Is there someone who would second? And again, I can't see everybody, so maybe- I'll second that. Okay, was that Pam? Yep. Yes, thank you, Pam. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it back to Emily, if you just want to call the vote. Thank you, Mike. Um, is there, I actually don't know how it works with acclamation, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> well, it, the vote. It, it's just a simple motion. It, you, you would see if there are any uh, uh, abstentions, any opposition. Okay. Yep. Same as others. Okay. Are there any opposed or would like to abstain from this motion? As far as uh, discussion, I just was curious, Mike, because you were the one to motion, but you're not yourself a director. Is that fine for an election? I'm just not sure. Yeah, any yeah. anybody at a general meeting can move a motion. Excellent, yeah. thank you. Or vote on any of the motions as or well. Or vote on any of the motions, yes. Everybody gets one vote, every, every member in good standing. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't sound like anybody is opposed or abstaining. So motion carried. Yep. And congratulations to the directors and best wishes for a really another productive uh, year coming up. Thank you, Mike. Oops. Thanks so much, Mike. I thought for a moment there that Pam, you were going to nominate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andrew, do you have a few concluding words for today? No, I'm just really grateful for everyone's participation, um, for their presence here. And yeah, I'm excited for the new team that's assembled. We, uh, we have a board meeting scheduled for this coming week. So we're going to get started right away. I think the first order of business is to plan a board retreat. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to this next year with all of you and, and the broader Immerse community as well. Yes, thank you all for attending today. And I am looking forward to working with the new directors next year. Oh, I was worried that it wasn't recording, but it was, it recorded the whole. <laughs> <laughs> we never really gave an opportunity for questions. I'm not sure. It's over. Basically, Emily's about to adjourn. But if there are any questions lingering among the participants here, then we can take those quick. It's like most people are probably ready to get on with their Saturday. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to go. I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be it's been like about three, over three years that I've been with Immerse and I'm going to miss everybody. You guys feel like home in lots of ways. And um, so I'll still be a member. And so I'll see you that way at the very least. But I look forward to some in-person time again, too. So and thanks for serving again. It's a it's a big responsibility and it's an awesome organization. So thanks. You know where you live, Pam. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Pam. I learned lots from you. Right back at you, Mark. 
someday we'll play in the lab with slime molds. I just like to say that it's lovely okay. to see how Immerse has grown since we first formed it. It's lovely, mm -hmm. super. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks to our former directors who are present here today, Mark and Arian. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for your senior, you know, founding directors and really the ones who incorporated the organization. So that's, yeah, we really wouldn't be here without you in the midst of the pandemic. <laughs> Oh, it's it's absolutely wonderful to see how Immerse has grown and and where it's going, and it's it's a it's a beautiful thing to watch. It's really really great. So thank you so much. Wonderful to be a part of it. Oh, well, we're at the group hug stage, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual group hugs. All oh, um. I'll love you and leave you. So bye all and see you soon, I hope. As I see a comment from Zeus there, um, I forgot to thank Zeus. He was a big, big contributor to our fundraising event. So when I spoke to mm -hmm. that, thanks so much, Zeus, for carrying that event in a big way. And Kendall, too, actually. You were a real cheerleader. <laughs> we were very deliberate in um, poaching you as a director. <laughs> I'm happy to be poached. It's totally okay. All right. At this point, I'll adjourn the meeting. Thanks again to everyone who joined today. And if you're in the Vancouver area or the islands close by, hopefully you can spend some time outside in the sun. Thank you. Enjoy the sunshine. Here, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Jakey.